So now it's going to get real, and we're actually going to start looking at some of the material in the book. And um, at least my methodology for this is that I will go through the slides. Not every slide is going to get the same attention, and uh, some slides I'm not going to do at all because uh, I don't want to want to read the slides to you. You have the slides in the in the content section anyway. Um, this is this chapter is actually sort of the introductory chapter of the whole thing. So it's going to be a little disjointed as we start moving through because it's going to talk about one topic for a bit, then I'll talk about another topic for a bit. So just uh, bear bear with it. Uh, feel free to follow uh, in the book, or if you uh, want, you can even have a look at the slides. Um, anyway, so let's just sort of start now with uh, with uh, with looking sort of at the material from. The systems analysis uh, class. So, uh, the point of this chapter, as I said, is a little bit disjointed. We're going to be looking at describing the impact of systems, what actually systems analysis is, the different types of systems, and and the businesses that sort of are um, are um, using them. Obviously, different businesses. Like if you're in manufacturing, for example, your IT needs are going to be a lot different than if you're a hospital, and that'll be a lot different than if you are uh, a college. So uh, the business profiles and the models that come from those will completely impact um, uh, the business systems you need. And I'm actually, as I'm thinking about it, at least a few of you are in retail. So even that will uh, have, have some issue. And also the idea here too, that, that um, even the way businesses are communicating has uh, changed dramatically just even in the last five years. And so there'll be a little bit of discussion about that. And we'll kind of head ultimately to the idea of how we can do uh, system design uh, in a more um, holistic way. So we're going to talk about basically the system design uh, life cycle and our role uh, in it. All right. So one quick thing I always sort of talk about, it's sort of a little bit of a story here. Um, it's amazing how important IT actually is uh, to all industries, even if uh, all the other people don't want to actually admit it. Uh, a classic example is uh, my wife was actually in a travel business, one of the largest businesses, uh, travel businesses in Canada. Um, and they were going to do an upgrade of, uh, actually not even upgrade, a system conversion from one thing to another. And uh, the conversion itself went very, very badly. And within three months, the largest travel uh, company in Canada uh, went out. It went bankrupt. So three months. And I kind of see a lot of that stuff still actually happening out there, like millions or not billions of dollars just vanishing uh, for, uh, because of poorly executed projects. And of course, everyone starts pointing their finger at the project manager for that, but I have a lot of sympathy for the project managers because they're at the mercy of a bunch of people who don't understand IT. So um, when you look at this slide, uh, they used to actually say something like, um, previous versions would say things like, uh, so, you know, so software is the weapon used by I, you know, businesses or whatever. They, they took away the militancy part of this, but I do want you to understand that, that uh, information technology is vital for pretty well every organization I can actually think of. Uh, even when my kids were in softball, I remember thinking uh, we had this sort of these rules as to how to uh, rotate kids through the, you know, the various outfield and infield positions. And I remember thinking, hmm, you know, if we had software, we could completely automate this. So I don't know if that would have made our team more successful. But anyway, there you go. That's what I wanted to say about that. Also, um, so here's some sort of definitions of sort of what information technology is. I sure hope you guys already know a lot of what information technology is. But if you want a definition, there it is on the screen in the, in the book. And it's interesting. Uh, even to this day, we actually still have people punching in and punching out. So although it's nice that they're sort of uh, implying this is 1953. I'll tell you right now that Bloomington Public Schools does this in 2020. So uh, the idea of the punch guard and, the, and uh, that isn't necessarily uh, going away, but things definitely have become uh, dramatically changing and changing. And everyone's gonna say at a faster and faster rate. And that's true, they, they are changing at a faster and faster rate. I don't know when it's gonna slow down if ever, but uh, 
um, things are constantly changing. And because of that, we need to basically have a more sort of holistic view of how to actually build systems. So your the title of the book that you guys have is Systems Analysis and Design. So it's not surprising that pretty quick they bring up um, the definition of it, right? Which is step-by-step -step process for developing high quality information systems. The key I want you to get from this is it's a step-by-step. Um, an easy uh, example, and by the way, a lot of my examples, at least in the beginning, aren't necessarily IT examples, and that's done for a reason. A lot of these principles uh, that we're gonna learn, at least in the first half of the course, they can be applied outside of IT. So anyway, uh, they didn't even originate in IT. So anyway, um, step by step. So what, what this is about here is, I want you to imagine uh, once when I had, um, when, I, when my daughter was very, very young, her room was remarkably messy. I'm sure some of you parents uh, will s sympathize with that. And so I walked in and I said, man, we had got to clean this up. And so I told her, let's, let's you know, uh, let's clean up your room. Well, of course, she freaked out and kind of went to a fetal position and laid on the, on the floor. You know, it's too tough. It's too tough. So I realized the definition of the problem was a little bit much, you know, clean up your room. So we had to do a step-by-step -step process as to how to clean up a room. For example, um, one step was just to get laundry off the floor that already would, would do a lot of stuff and it would actually expose the stuff that's underneath the laundry. Another step, put books into the bookshelf. Uh, some steps had to happen before other steps. Uh, you know, maybe for example, making the bed could pre be the prerequisite for getting the, um, I don't know, getting the clothes off the floor because you'd put them on the bed for sorting or something like that. The point is that you take a big problem and you break it down. I have a lot of sympathy for my daughter because about at least once a week at my corporate job, I'm ready to curl up into a fetal position and go under my desk and say, it's too hard, it's too hard. Because a lot of the stuff that I do is too hard for, uh, for me just to sort of, you know, go off and just do it. Everything has to be broken down into, into steps. We have to have a bigger understanding about what the strategic direction is of this particular project. We have to kind of understand um, in my case, my project interacts with a bunch of different corporate uh, lines of businesses, and so I have to be in step with them. Anyway, there you go. Uh, I view myself ultimately as a systems analyst uh, because this, this describes what I do. I plan, develop, and maintain information systems. I manage the projects, tasks, I try to resource them. Don't get too much into costs because of this is the nature of my line of business. Uh, but we definitely, you know, go through the scheduling of the costs. And a big deal for me is that I also do a lot of meetings and a lot of presentations. And I never write any memos, but you can imagine these are effectively emails, emails, reports, and then documentation. All, all of this goes into what a systems analyst does. When you think about a business analyst, a business analyst might do a lot of meetings and they might, you know, write a lot of reports and deliver presentations. A computer programmer analyst, which is kind of what I was doing in the beginning, would probably do a lot of development, all right, development and maintenance, but maybe not as much planning. A systems analyst is sort of a level, I don't want to say a level above it, that's a little um, pejorative, but I would say it's a, um, it's a position that brings in from these other analysts, um, and there you go. A lot of times systems analysts, by the way, most of the time they come from the technical side. Every so often someone will come from the business side and become a systems analyst. So when you think about an actual system, a system is made up of these parts. When you think about what D2L is, D2L has got some hardware behind it. It's got some software behind it. All your homework and the grades or the data, how we actually do D2L, how we run classes, that would be the processes, and then you and I are the people. Every system has got these uh, uh, these elements to it, if they're in IT anyway. Even if they're not in IT, it's hard to imagine. Um, I uh, was just actually uh, asked this question by somebody um, in a completely different context in a, in a, in a totally different company. It was interesting. We actually sat down and we went through his system on what his hardware was, software, data, processes, and people. So this is a pretty standard way to break down uh, what a system is. Uh, when you think about this, um, 
uh, all systems require input. Basically, the idea of data as it flows through the system. Data, by the way, this data doesn't even have to necessarily be electronic data. Back in the days when desks used to have an inbox and an outbox, like an actual physical inbox, outbox, those letters or whatever, those would have in theory been um, uh, data. So anyway, let's go through this. So I think here's the hardware and they show you a nice beautiful set of servers or whatever. Um, Moore's Law, definitely look that one up. It still seems to be pretty consistent. It's the idea ultimately that uh, data uh, processing chips double in speed every uh, 18 months. I, we all thought it was gonna crash in the 90s, it was gonna be impossible, but then there was a technological leap and now it's continuing to double. And uh, just when we think that maybe it can't double anymore, uh, there's this concept out there of quantum computing, which will probably enable to double, at least you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, and that's not trivial. You know, for those of you that truly understand doubling, it it uh, it um, it can be quite something. So anyway, so the doubling anyway. Moore's law is about the doubling of computational speed. All right, then you got the software, and obviously the software controls the hardware even when you think about the most primitive software, BIOS. BIOS is making, um, I think that's basic input output system software maybe. Anyway, uh, that, that probably brings me to a good point. Sometimes I'm on the edge of what I actually know about. So if I make a mistake, feel free to correct me. But anyway, um, you got the BIOS, you got the operating system, which sort of fits into the concept of system software here. That's kind of what they mean. You actually have the application software, and they've got different ways of describing that. They have horizontal and vertical. Horizontal is sort of a system that can be used, probably the same system in multiple companies. So I would suspect, for example, that Hennepin Tech, Donaldson that makes air filters, and Oracle all use, they're all different companies, but they all use something like a human resource system, right? Something that basically uh, helps management with, uh, with their employees. However, Donaldson has got manufacturing software. Uh, uh, Dakota Tech or, or Hennepin Tech or any of the colleges I teach at, they have educational software. And then, uh, so that's a straight, a vertical. It's like a line of business specific. Missile software is another example, or, or even medical software. And then legacy, all that just means is it's something that existed before you built your system. It's the old system. It's the old system. So you've got our hardware, we've got our software, we have data. Now they basically say it's stored in tables because they're being a little on the primitive side. Not all data is stored in tables. Uh, but, you know, much as I like that to be the case, because that's what I'm most familiar with. But you know, um, before there, there is data before tables and there's data after tables. But for now, you may as well just believe it's all in tables. Then we actually have the processes. What is the process we're trying to emulate? For example, how do you guys get your grades at the end of the course? That's a process. And, and in that process, we have the idea of you guys putting your homework into D12, me marking it, and then some system ultimately that takes all those grades and gives you at the end a letter grade. That would be sort of a business process. Now, hardware, software, data, and processes are great, but there have to be people ultimately that are um, dependent on this and or I guess as they say here, interested in it. Stakeholders are anyone interested in the, uh, in the system that you are building or maintaining. And interesting by the way, interested, um, I would define that almost as their success at their job depends on the system. That's, that's what I think interested is. They're not just casually interested, like they need your system to do their job. And so those are the stakeholders. All right, so as we can imagine now, business is rapidly globalizing. You know, we can thank our friend the internet for that. And so we basically need technology to get seamless access to the information. I, when I first encountered uh, my iPhone and how I was actually caught in a blizzard and I went to show up at one place to get something for one of my kids. The place was closed and I found out I went to the wrong address. Now, here's the thing, right? And I know this is going to be a duh moment for all of you, but at the time, this was brand new. I noticed I went in my phone to my email and in my email, there was the address of where I was supposed to go. 
and I pushed on the address and it opened up the Apple Maps and all of a sudden I had a nice direction as to where I got to go. And maybe the day before this would have happened, I would have just simply phoned my wife and said, where am I supposed to go? So I thought the way that the email was interacting with the mapping software was just incredible. I'll tell you, if you ever go to Winnipeg, they have mastered public transport. I know, you th well, at least by the way, public transportation by bus. They don't have really anything else but buses. But their bus system and the way it integrates with uh, the maps is just astounding. So anyway, um, I just want you to imagine that's sort of the seamless information from different systems. And then cloud-based or subscription services, that is also becoming a bigger and bigger uh, deal. Um, obviously, everything is becoming internet-centric. They got some conversation here about internet models, and I'll just leave that for you guys to read. What a business um, profile. So the idea here kind of, again, is, is this idea that the type of business that you have will drive the type of information systems that you, that you need. That's probably pretty obvious. But what that means, though, is that if you get hired into a company, you probably should then be looking at what is their mission statement, what, how are they organized, who are their competitors, what are their restrictions, where do they think they're going, you know, all this kind of stuff will impact the kind of software solutions that they will actually need. And if you can actually stay ahead of that and anticipate, um, that would be pretty good. Don't go too far ahead. I've actually just been burned myself because in our group, uh, I thought we were going to be cool and use this particular technology that uh, was supposedly a future direction, only to find out that our people uh, decided outside of our group that that was too hard. And now all of a sudden I've lost all support for that. So it's sort of like stepping out onto a ledge and finding out that there was actually no ledge there. So now I got to figure out how we do it. So anyway, um, but be aware anyway of, of, of the corporate direction. Another obvious example, Oracle is really big on cloud. So obviously all of my solutions for my group, my our product are all effectively on-prem solutions. Not really, but anyway, um, but knowing that the corporate direction is cloud, I can start sort of predicting what kind of stuff is, is gonna come out. So understanding the business profile, understanding their processes, and I gotta tell you, most of the time people don't know what the processes are. I mean, there might be a few experts out there. It'd be awesome if you can eventually kind of get them modeled, and then, uh, and then even there's a notation out there. I don't think we do too much with this in this course, but it, it is something that you can look at and basically say, hey, you know, um, Describe the process of how you get a grade in, in, in a D2L. So modeling. Here they're kind of showing you sort of a, some kind of example of, of business process modeling. But again, I would suggest this summer or whatever, if you're interested, Googling it. And there's all sorts of you know, good demos on that. All right, uh, so here they're talking about business information systems and I'm just going to more or less kind of leave these next few because we're already getting a bit long on what I actually want to talk about. So they kind of, what I sort of skipped through there is a bunch of different types of systems, right? D2L is a different type of system than, um, uh, than the registration system, which is different than the payroll system, right? Each of these systems are meant to sort of a, a kind of help in a business process. I like this slide and I, I kind of stop here because I wanted to sort of get you guys to understand again that there is no one system that fits all the needs of all these people. There is no one set of data or information that fits these kind of people. These people up here are typically thinking more strategically. These people down here are typically thinking more operationally. So an example here is where is the company going? An example down here is why can't I find my order, right? Or why can't I register for classes? Whereas up here, they're probably trying to figure out uh, what is um, the demographics in the college. So, um, so just be aware that basically different areas in the organization have different sort of uh, different needs and it's our job to sort of anticipate those needs. And that's kind of what this was about here. All right, modeling. A huge deal for being a systems analyst is the ability to communicate complex ideas to uh, people who almost most of the time don't want to hear it. So here's the thing. 
I am a huge fan of doing models and I'm a huge fan of graphic models. I'm not a big fan of this model, but um, describing a business process in a Word document is horrible. If, unless you can describe it and then model it, have an image. I know not everybody thinks in images, but it I, I do, and it certainly it certainly helps. So we're going to be doing we will do a little bit of a business model, but we're going to be looking at data models, um, both a logical data model and a physical data model. And for those of you that have done database classes, it's not quite the same. I'm, and you know, welcome to IT. By the way, I'll be using terms differently. But um, we're going to be doing something called a data flow diagram, which is describing how data flows through a system. And then we'll get to something that you guys would remember if you took those database classes, uh, the uh, entity relationship diagram, and then probably the table structure diagram as well. We'll be looking at object models, how you can sort of describe objects. I won't show you this, but the textbook does cover network models and then process models. But the point is, there's a bunch of... Um, ways to sort of describe systems that isn't just a bunch of people typing Word documents down. And another thing too that kind of helps sort of model is this idea of prototyping. And prototyping is, is basically creating um, a model of a system that basically does one thing. So for example, I had to create a um, report dashboard, which I don't know if that the best example because you might not know what that is but this person wanted to track their sales and all this kind of stuff they basically had three pie charts and a chart that they wanted to basically have up on a web page so the prototype for me was i put together a quick web page in html and i slapped in three images of a pie chart and one image of a chart chart and um like in a spreadsheet and i showed it to them that was the prototype and then we sort of described you know how this would interact what the data was and um and it was actually pretty good the weakness of the prototype and it's even saying here the disadvantage there's two of them the disadvantage is that once you show a prototype to them they're them being the stakeholders they will now lock on to that prototype and any creativity now will probably go out the window so for example pie charts the guy saw pie, pie charts he's not necessarily gonna think that maybe they should use scatter graphs, maybe they should be four charts, maybe they should be, you know, something else. He's now locked in, and this was a he I was talking to, he's now locked in to how this thing is gonna look. So be careful with your prototypes. You wanna gather a lot of requirements up front first, then maybe do a prototype. And the other thing that's a little kind of irksome is that once you create a prototype, the very next question from these guys is, well, when can I have it? Because of course, in their mind, it's almost done. And as I just told you, this was a web page with four images in it. I mean, these images could have been pictures of my kids, right? I mean, there's uh, no muscle behind uh, the uh, the web page. So you could be ready to sort of explain to them. I used a match uh, matchbox car analogy. That basically, if you look at a matchbox car and you uh, uh, th that's kind of a prototype of a car. It's got like doors that open and rolls, but nobody uh, at any point is in their right mind is going to say, okay, that's a nice car. When can I get in it and drive it to Chicago, right? So, so they are models. And by the way, prototypes can be uh, created using computer-aided systems engineering tools or case tools. Uh, those of you from my database class, we use uh, SQL Deve uh, Developer. That was sort of a case tool because it had the ability that we could model data and then generate code from it. Um, there's a lot more of those kind of things out there. And hopefully, wherever you go, you'll have access to case tools. There are different ways to do the SDLC, System Development Lifecycle, and um, we're gonna be focusing mostly on structured analysis. Structured analysis isn't going away. Um, you know, the cool kids are doing agile, and of course some cool kids are doing object-oriented. I've been lucky enough to be in an industry where we only had structured, then the cool kids were object-oriented, and then they didn't become cool anymore because agile became cool, and who knows what the next thing is gonna be cool. I will say this, that the bits that we're gonna learn here can be used in OO and Agile, and that's how I sleep at night, still teaching this as a structured, um, in a structured way. Structured analysis is basically a phased approach. You do something and then you, that goes to the next phase, you do something else, you do something else, you do something else. Um, the acronym SDLC, 
again, system development lifecycle. Um, you'll see that in job applications, you know, must be familiar with all aspects of the SDLC. Now, at least you know what that is. And, uh, and I guess the thing I'll just say, sure, it's process oriented and it's predictive, maybe, right? I don't know, read your book on that one. So this is actually it. And what I want you to notice is that your books are color coded. And of course, for whatever reason, they chose not to use the same colors uh, here because they could have, but they didn't. So anyway, um, but what I want you to see is this is sort of a waterfall model. And if I could draw in this medium, I would want to draw sort of a staged waterfall model where basically um, you flow off of one and then into another and then into another and then into another and into another stage, right? These are all stages. That's the first thing I want you to understand. Stage, system planning, oops, system planning. Actually, will it work? I don't think it's gonna work. Are you gonna work? No, you're not gonna work. Okay, forget it. Anyway, system planning happens, and then, um, and then what comes out of that is the uh, preliminary investigation report, or what I like to call the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the business requirements document. Yeah, this is gonna be a high quality video, I can tell. Anyway, business requirements document. The business requirements document is then fed into the systems analysis phase. Once that's done, uh, you'll get out of that system requirements documents. Usually this is a logical version of the system you're trying to build. That gets fed into the system design, and then out of that comes design documents. Those are more physical, again, from the database perspective. That's where your entity relationship diagrams are, the more the structured ones, the table structure diagrams. Then from that, you actually go in there and implement the systems. You, most of your college life has been building things. And it's interesting because this is, if you looked at your book, I don't know if you can see this from in here, but it's the yellow and it's a tiny, tiny, tiny sliver. So most of your college life, you're doing the tiny, tiny, tiny sliver. And, and really it's only in this course that you get most of this stuff happening. Anyway, you get out of this pops the actual system. Then after that, you got to basically maintain the system, um, which is what this stage is. And then I would say that with the maintenance, uh, at the end of this, you also get a retirement phase where uh, where you have to basically put it down. And that's uh, that's kind of what all this stuff was about. So I'll let you have a look at that. They bring up object-oriented analysis, and I'll let you read that. And then this is more of a agile or spiral kind of idea. And I'll let you look at those two. And I will tell you this, you can't be too pure on this. Like a lot of, you got agile purists, you get structured purists, you get OO purists. At the end of the day, your job is to service the business as, uh, as best as you can. And, and you'll find uh, that a lot of SDLCs are really actually fusions or hybrids of, of a bunch of different ones. The next part of this uh, chapter is all about basically the, uh, the wonders of an IT department and how IT departments can be broken down or at least the different roles. Um, I'll let you read that. It's, you know, it's, it's okay the, the way that they kind of dealt with that. But, you know, the systems analyst is typically involved actually in a few of those roles, so I don't know. Anyway. As far as the systems analyst goes, again, here's a deeper take on what we do. We investigate, analyze, develop, design, develop, install, evaluate, and maintain the actual systems. And we're constantly talking with users and managers inside and outside the organization. I am on the phone with people across the globe all the time. So, and I'm talking with people inside Oracle, outside Oracle, people inside my line of business, and outside my line of business. I've become pretty good at dealing with the variety of accents that I'm, I'm working with. The sun never sets on, on, uh, on my empire, so to speak. So um, I hope you like talking if you're going to pursue this, because that's kind of uh, uh, the way that works. So it says here we act as a translator between managers and programmers. In theory, by the way, so does a business analyst. Um, I love to think that I'm the best line of defense in an IT disaster. I just spend most of my time in anxiety, wondering when I can see all the disasters. I don't know. Anyway, whatever. Um, but here's the deal. Being able to listen and communicate, those are kind of the big deals for being a systems analyst, as well as what most of you would expect, technical knowledge and critical thinking. 
my my personal greatest weakness is I don't understand the business as well as the business does. But I find that typically almost all of us don't really understand the business as much as the business does. And the business keeps changing anyway. So when it comes to sort of getting, uh, oh, I guess by the way, this is probably a continuation of the previous point. Let me just say that again. So yeah, knowledge, skills, and education. Obviously, it'd be nice to have some kind of education. That's what you guys are doing. You're doing actually a nice little degree or diploma or certificate. You're getting some education. There is speaking of certificate, by the way, there's actually no certification as a systems analyst. There is for project management, there is for business analyst, but all we end up having to do is typically we do technical certifications. Um, even agile, by the way, um, that doesn't have to be a systems analyst, but anyway. Uh, there's a uh, one of the reasons I have kept sort of the format of you guys doing multiple choice questions for your quizzes isn't necessarily because it's easier, but it's because that is kind of what your certification exams are going to be like. So I, I kind of continuing to try to train you for that. All right. Uh, the systems analyst role isn't going away. And I don't think the systems analyst role is really offshoreable either. There's a lot of roles that sometimes, you know, you, you, you'll you find kind of get shot off to what's called low cost countries. Uh, if your company is in North America, it, the system analyst role might remain in North America because they tend to keep it closer to the business. I think that's the only reason I've survived is, they, they, you know, I've been at Oracle now 20 years. I've been waiting any minute I could even get laid off during this course because I know that we're laying off people. So, um, so who knows? But uh, but I feel reasonably secure at the level I'm at now that I will be able to land a job uh, job here because systems analysts are actually uh, they're actually needed. All right, um, and here they just talk about the trends in IT, and that was it. All right, so that's all I kind of got for this chapter. I'll do another slide, or another slide, another presentation where I want to talk about the actual assignment. Talk to you then.